hello to everyone and thank you for joining us here on the Capital Insider series today as we get to talk with uh, Anup Jain, who is the managing partner. And uh, also, uh, he's been one of the, you know, uh, sort of he's seen the entire landscape of being an entrepreneur as well as uh, being an investor working with the startup and guiding startups and now investing in startups at his role in Oreos Ventures. And Oreos indeed has been doing across the spectrum early stage funding for a lot of startups, right from consumer tech startups to, um, uh, you know, uh, tech startups. But today what we're really going to touch upon with uh, him is to understand the fintech, which has been a very, very large space and very wide canvas space, I would say. Um, and so we're really going to sort of touch base with him on what he sees as the future of fintech and other startups, particularly post the pandemic, how things are going to pave out and what, what's going to happen. Um, always happy to have questions from our audience or so whatever you want to ask, what if, whatever it is that you would like to um, sort of want Anoop to answer. So please just put your question right out there in the Q&A box or on Facebook. Uh, as you wish, uh, we will put it on across to Anoop and we will make sure that uh, he answers it today. Anoop, of course, as you can see, has done a lot of work, not just in the digital space, but also in the physical space as well. He's been part of Yum Brands, Bata as well in the retail space. And now, of course, uh, he's in the VC space where he is uh, guiding as well as investing in D2C brands, social commerce, edtech. But we talk with him today about fintech, which is a growing space and has changed quite dynamically during the pandemic. So welcome, Anu. Uh, wonderful having you here today. Um, you know, let me Thank start with that. asking mm. you this: that how do you see? Um, so how do you see uh, that uh, in in the current times, the investing pace in fintech has uh, changed, and where is it heading towards within the fintech space? Because it's so large. And what are the areas of fintech as a fund you would be interested to look at now? Sure. So thank you so much uh, for inviting me, Ritu. Always a pleasure to hang out with you, if I may call it. <laughs> yeah, yeah. yeah. And um, one has met you in several conferences, so I respect you highly. So thank you for having me over, and I hope the pleasure. audience uh, um, loves our session today, finds it useful. Um, Fintech, uh, look, post-COVID uh, struck, uh, I think the first quarter was extremely um, uncertain. Correct. So many Fintechs actually uh, stopped operations particularly in the areas of lending. Uh, so that definitely took a backseat. In fact, that extended into the second quarter as well. Um, even our investments, we uh, felt that it's better to be safe than to be sorry. Uh, uh, it, was, it was more important to ensure that you have a healthy loan book than an ever expanding loan book. Uh, so you need to be standing on a solid foundation in a FinTech business, especially in lending. Um, so that uh, definitely took a bit of a backseat. And um, what that has done is as one has come out, I think lending started back again in August, September, uh, as the economy started to roll back and we saw the impact on the uh, overall, you know, GST collections is a good indicator of formal uh, economy starting back. And so we saw October and um, September uh, coming back to pre-COVID levels, very close to pre-COVID levels. Uh, so that's when the uh, lending started to fall back again, but the period uh, basically helped in separating the men from the boys, so to speak. Uh, so uh, those who had uh, expanded the loan book, but with a greater degree of risk, they found a lot of NPAs on their uh, loan books and therefore mm -hmm. they were less healthy as businesses coming out. And that put a lot of stress and some startups would have shut down for sure uh, if they had gone very aggressive. Um, and of course, uh, the, um, uh, the other part was that, you know, investors started to look at uh, financials extremely minutely uh, than ever before. Uh, there was a somewhat of a bull run uh, as far as uh, VC investing was going on. Mm -hmm. And that with starting with the global phenomenon of uh, we were getting uh, you know, marked down uh, and some of these sectors getting badly hit, travel, hospitality, leisure, uh, entertainment, and, uh, you know, um, and these uh, real estate related verticals. That certainly meant that there was a you know parallel impact, and uh, therefore, uh, uh, some part of the portfolio being exposed to some of these verticals. Everybody started to sort of get a little more conservative right. in every other sector. Hmm. Uh, so uh, there was there was a slowdown in investing for every VC firm, and so it was for us. I think it was also very operational oriented. Uh, 
um, because we didn't know when this whole thing was going to end. And therefore, uh, were we good with making decisions uh, purely over a Zoom call? I think uh, over a period of time, we've all crossed that hurdle and we've all come around the bend, uh, looking and feeling more confident and being able to make decisions. So we made a recent decision in the marketplace model, uh, purely, you know, never met the founders, never visited their office uh, uh, just very recently. Uh, so that trend I think has started off. Um, every VC firm was looking at protecting their existing portfolio firms and seeing what they can do and we were no different. Uh, it was our first uh, port of call. In the FinTech side, uh, um, the themes that are emerging uh, are going to be definitely micropayments. That's a big theme for us. We've already invested in a company called City Cash, uh, you know, not too long ago. Uh, of course, during COVID, mobility and uh, public shared mobility came to a full stop. I mean, metros, buses were all shut, trains were shut, uh, but that is uh, come back again. So micropayments is back in focus because in India, um, you know, a large portion of the middle class is still uncovered through digital payments. I know UPI is doing $1, $1 billion of payments a month and all of that, but all of that is happening amongst people like us, uh, so to speak. So people living in the top cities, what's happening is, you know, if you yourself noticed, uh, Ritu, and I'm sure everybody in the audience would have noticed, we have credit cards, we have debit cards, but we are not having to take them out of our pockets and swipe them on a machine. Mm -hmm. So we are getting used to using our smartphone, which has the same um, a credit card, a debit card embedded in an application and then scanning the QR code and uh, uh, putting the UPI pin and straight away debiting the amount or you know charging it to a credit card. Much more uh, convenience also. Much more convenient, secure, you don't, you know, you're not um, scared of cloning, etc. Mm -hmm. So I think there what's happening is that there is a churn which is happening within the existing players, right? Everybody's eating into everybody's share and then that WhatsApp has got its approvals coming in through the geo WhatsApp combination. So that's a new um, player in the ring, but micropayments has not been touched. Micropayments are defined by BCG as less than 150 rupees. And that's what India lives on for 400 million people. Uh, you know, they, they take shared public transport rides, paratransit rides of autos, it's electric rickshaws, et cetera, all within 10, 20 rupees, 30 rupees, 40 rupees, et cetera. They eat um, at stalls, hawkers, et cetera. The, the denominations are the same. Yeah. Nobody's really digitized that. And the way to digitize that is through NFC. And you have to acquire large millions of consumers through the public bus transport system. So yeah. we certainly saw that as an upcoming space um, and uh, therefore have invested in a company called City Cash, uh, which got a contract from MSRTC. Now they're piloting at other uh, public bus transport corporations and uh, uh, hope to change uh, the micropayments industry. Uh, the other bit, I think, again, uh, I'll refer to the BCG report quite liberally and, uh, you know, uh, that's just to give an anchor to everybody. It, it is available on the internet, I think so. Um, uh, urban India has been defined into, you know, sort of the very HNIs and India 1, India 2, India 3. So uh, the India 1 and India 2 is uh, extremely over-serviced, right? So they got, they got, in fact, they don't want to pick up their phones, right? Because there's so many sales calls coming through yeah. trying to sell the same guy yet another credit card, yet another loan and all that which they don't need. Yeah. But on the other hand, uh, India 3 is underserved. And that is because the, um, there is not much money to be made. You know, So uh, frankly, there's a large number of people buying a cheap insurance policy for 3 lakh rupees with a 1,000 rupee premium means nothing to a agent uh, in terms of commissions, right? Because they simply have to sell it to dozens and thousands of consumers to be able to make a living out of it which is sufficient enough for them to feed their families at the end of the month. So obviously this job has to be done by technology. Sure. Uh, it cannot be done by an individual. It's not worth their time. So nobody does it. So there is no distribution model. Nobody cares about that. Um, plus the, uh, the population is, is, is thin on terms of disposable income. So one has to do automated technology-based underwriting and therefore be able to have very low cost of acquisition operations and underwriting. Uh, to be able to make the whole model sustainable for both the consumer and the insurer on the insurance side, as well as maybe on the lending side. Um, so these kind of models are now in focus, uh, which are serving the underserved, right? So we see firms, both impact and those which focus on ESG as well. Uh, both of them are interested in models like these, which are creating, uh, if I may say a Bajaj for the India three, there is a Bajaj for tier one, but where is the Bajaj finance for, uh, for tier three or India three? So that 
is 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 pretty much required. Mm. Uh, bear in mind also that you know, uh, combined with the first thing that I said, which is this audience is mostly relying on micro payments, which are mostly done in cash. Cash leaves no trace. So there is there is no digital footprint. There is no data. How do I lend you money if I don't know how your expenses were, what your income was, uh, what your ins and outs were? Um, so I think that needs to get captured, and that's coming on right now more, uh, uh, more and more. Uh, uh, you know, as we as we go along, this is the uh, uh, these are the financial behemoths of tomorrow. So the Bajaj Finance for India three is yet to be created. The Visa and Mastercard for India three is yet to be created. These are the large opportunities um, in the fintech space. On the insurance side, I think it will get. Similarly done. Um, so we've had a few models which are socially distributed, like Turtle Mint, etc. Um, and uh, these will continue to be exploited for reaching out to uh, people who are beyond the um, India One or the over-serviced population. Uh, on the wealth side, uh, what we are seeing is right now there is a big jump in the stock markets. Uh, government has held interest rates at a historic low over the last three or four years. Uh, I I can't think of a cheaper home loan available in India for the last five years. Mm. Um, I think now home loans are available at 7%. I mean, that's crazy. I mean, I remember paying a home loan at 12% uh, way back in time. I mean, so so therefore, um, um, what has happened is as a result, it is no longer remunerative for a person to save their money in fixed deposits because the rates are so low, mm. right? Earlier, the fixed deposit rates used to be 7%, 7.5%. And now they're, you know, five, five and a half percent. So that money has gone. Um, so you have to take a risk in order to make money, right? So therefore, that means that wealth management, both at scale and without scale, which means for a limited number of individuals, you definitely had some degree of, you know, wealth managers, et cetera, but that's 100 crores plus. But people who are, let's say, between five crores to 50 crores of net worth, um, those will require digitized, uh, wealth management platforms and sub five crores, which is a large number of you know middle class and young population at that, will require to be on platforms to be able to manage their financial health in, a, in an appropriate manner. Now that again cannot be done by you know um, a human beings or person knocking on your door or you going somewhere and sitting in front of a banker and having a detailed conversation. A bank branch is not a place to make a financial decision. Uh, uh, so. Um, this will give rise to you know a wealth tech business as well i feel so sub five crores may be socially distributed a platform which is tech enabled but independent financial advisors working on it five to ten crores may be a combination of low touch as well as you know tech where the clients can do certain things themselves where they don't want to spend time talking to somebody right uh, and they can just easily read reports or make decisions based on something which is sent to them on a dashboard so what you'll need is analytics um, so that is another area which could come up in the future, uh, for sure. Sure. See how, how, I mean, don't you think fintech has become really broad based? I mean, there's so many dimensions to fintech today. And I remember it started with a very, you know, um, I mean, uncomplex wallet when I first heard the term fintech back in, I think, 2013 or maybe 2012. And uh, today, you know, the, the bucket of fintech has become very large. So do you feel that? Um, fintech itself needs to break itself up into, you know, different um, sort of domains in order to get the real VC interest. I mean, there is insurance, there's wealth, there's lending, then there's micropayments within payments. So there's just, and all of them are like industries by themselves. They are not, yes. they're not a small hmm. play. So do you feel that if VCs were to look at all these buckets in, in a totally different sort of uh, sectors or as industries or sectors, it would lead to much bigger in the funding and much sort of clearer focus um, from investment perspective. Yes, so um, I totally agree with you. Look, FinTech is, um, is a very broad brush and uh, every VC firm has got its own priorities. Hmm. Uh, so, you know, if you organize a FinTech forum, certainly you see the split into the various segments and they have different panels for different uh, subtopics and sub segments. Uh, but you're right that, uh, you know, we need to break this up into different uh, segments and uh, uh, make it clearer, at least for the founders, hmm. uh, to be able to see who they can approach in a VC firm, which VC firm is is interested in it, which is not. 
and maybe even organize events which are very specific to a segment hmm. because you can go deep into insurance insurance is you know life really? non life there is car there is uh, you know health insurance there is um, different kinds of insurance and there are different uh, levels of insurance for different uh, socio economic strata um, so uh, sim- and there is there is very complex so even lending is very complex there is personal lending there is corporate lending <clears throat> so there is tremendous there is asset based lending non asset based lending unsecured has many different uh, kind of buckets within that so um, there is fintech is a very very large space then then of course you must have heard of neo banking i mean we had yeah. robinhood in the uk right. uh, revolut again in the uk there are a couple of attempts based over here but i'm not quite sure we haven't invested in neo banking we feel that we want to take you know sit back and wait and watch a little bit because we don't know how it will take off Hmm. uh but i've seen a few startups which are attempting neo banking hmm. uh for the millennials for college going or for early salary uh people hmm. essentially everybody is trying to make that layer of ui and ux which is very friendly yeah. and um you know it ties in better with the millennials so uh i think um, when i was growing up it was all about you know banking was a service it was a product and they were all selling products to us and we didn't know what the benefit was so all you know is that the bank was there for keeping the money and there was something called a fixed deposit later on somebody told us you know there's something called a mutual fund <clears throat> and of course there was equities and there were loans and that's it uh but we didn't know anything about principles of allocation between assets hmm. uh we had no idea how to plan for you know cycles of asset turnovers hmm. uh you know when when is the correct time to move out when is the correct time to move in so you'd be like feeling very good one day and then six months later because you didn't sell um you know there was a reaction in the market and you feel that you're you know net worth has gone down by 10 15% and you didn't do anything on it so um um uh, there is there is the advisory part the advisory requires data to be housed in a central place which mm. needs to be linked to market driven you know uh, metrics uh so the, the effort of putting that data unfortunately or fortunately has to be made very easy and seamless so that the consumer can virtually like you know upload their cams Uh, right. for example report onto a mutual fund platform similarly if there's any way of uploading your equity report on a platform and say that look uh, you know because none of us remember when did we buy a certain stock okay. you know uh, what is the date and what's going to happen and how many bonuses and dividends have gone or not gone to be able to figure out what's the real return from that stock okay. so what you're only seeing is one simple you know description on the on your trading window which is just saying long term capital gain or no long term capital gain and this is this that's it i mean this is the percentage now you have go have to calculate what's yeah. the irr because you've been holding the stock for 3 years so what's the 3 year irr um so you do and do it yourself so uh, i think those kind of things the analytics the very poor at this point of time mm. uh all of this gives rise to uh, opportunity of different kind but you're right fintech has to be really split up and there's a lot of work to be done there's also cyber security yeah. uh every day we hear you know this particular startup large one their data has been compromised so the last thing that you want is you know uh, you're registered across three platforms and two out of those three platforms uh they're saying that their data has got breached yes. uh cyber security has to be a very important aspect on the b2b side um no, selling it cyber security on the fintech side i mean you know today i know rbi is shouting virtually on every tv channel about you know be more secure do your funding or do your transactions uh, more be more informed about it so i mean do you think we need uh, i mean so cyber risk is anyway very large whether it comes to your personal data your financial data so do you think every sector in digital needs their own cyber risk startups to be able to manage the i mean security side of things and particularly in the fintech space yeah so um, this is the biggest fear that um, consumers have while registering on a on an unknown small you know fintech brand and giving all their data on a right. platform Yes. Uh I don't know how consumers do it. I definitely find myself a little, you know, I I wait for a reference to happen. <clears throat> and there has to be some safeguards over here. So um cybersecurity is become extremely important. Whenever transactions are happening, uh whether it's an e-commerce platform or it's a fintech which is taking in your data to give you a loan or a credit card or whatever it might be, um this is becoming a, a big business. uh and uh, uh startups who are working in that space uh they will do very well i think in the coming years um uh, because you know nobody's evolved a protocol 
and uh, uh, people must do that uh, before they build and scale their businesses and then are held responsible for so much of financial data on the internet because frauds can result, you know, in India forging and all of that. Uh, various things can happen. <clears throat> people have, you know, mm. by mistake, um, sort of given out OTPs and found that their accounts were flushed. Their wallets were now linked to UPI, so that introduces a risk as well. <clears throat> so sundry phone calls, all those things, you know. So um, one has to be really wary uh, and evolve the structure uh, of how you're interacting with consumers and how you are uh, taking in their documents and uh, what kind of assurance are you giving them about storing of their documents. And each time you access a document, perhaps you should have a security feature where you take permission from the consumer, whether it's from an OTP or otherwise. But before I can share it, I mean, I should be taking a permission. Your actual formal permission, whether you click on a button or you submit something, right? So I think those things are there. Um, they need to they need to come in, starting with the very simple stuff and then going on. Ideas to have deterrents over there in place and things which are very tech oriented. So there's no mutual and um, uh, there's no manual intervention, and uh, there is a there is a permission, and therefore there is a you know a building of mutual trust with the platform. Because with the bank, it was very easy because these were brands and they had branches, they had people, but- um, Relationship managers guiding yeah, you. Yeah, relationship managers, at least, you know, you can go there and, you know, maybe, you know, express your uh, uh, anger, upsetness, whatever, get a redressal over there. But what do you do over here? I mean, yeah. you're gonna write an email, but if your data has been compromised and you've got some money missing in your account or something, that's a big risk. I mean, the whole Carvey issue that happened, um, uh, told us that, you know, I was at the receiving end of it. In fact, uh, thank God it was very, you know, it was not that large, but in my end, but, you know, many uh, people just, um, you know, that whole thing led to a new wave of regulations on the SEBI side uh, on how transactions are being done over telephone or how they, how much they're allowed to hold your scripts in their, in their, what they call as a transfer account or whatever is the um, escrow account, uh, the pool account, sorry. Right. So um, um, I think that these are all um, these all have happened during this time, mm -hmm. and uh, these are all warning signs that uh, anything which is manual, anything which is um, uh, going without your permission, uh, that is, is is something to be wary of. So um, uh, that kind of level of savviness is is definitely coming in. Um, so do you feel more regulations are coming along the way for fintech industry? Look, um, we are an over-regulated place, so I don't want for regulations to come in. Uh, there are no, there are, um, in fact, RBI is releasing sandboxes for experiments, which is very encouraging, uh, both on the insurance side as well as on the payment side. Uh, but I think um, um, what is what is what is more necessary here is the uh, plugging of loopholes in technology, hmm. which allow these breaches to happen. Right. Um, and uh, certainly on the regulatory side, look, uh, it's a it's a, it's a bit knee jerk. So when the Carvey issue happened, then they introduced these regulations, and that became those regulations. Um, the SEC in the U.S., for example, has very advanced regulations for insider trading. There are lots of uh, you know hoops to cross. Uh, Everybody is very well aware. So you know every conversation, everything, um, all of that is 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 subject to that uh, you know uh, risk of litigation, all of that. Uh, and litigation is costly, so that keeps everybody honest as well. So the stakes have to be high enough. Uh, but here, the the, the, the the entire fraud uh, and, and scope of fraud can be sometimes very small in nature, and therefore it goes undetected and unchallenged. Uh, because, you know, yeah, I mean, if some somebody loses 25,000 rupees, if, you know, even 20,000 people lose, I mean, how much of a, you know, uh, a human cry will they create? And how will they organize themselves to address it? So it's the... That's what it, that's what it, because in India, the numbers are much higher uh, in terms of number of people. Uh, yeah. yeah, yeah, I think uh, new, new, new ways of working and therefore new changes that we'll continue to see. I mean, social media has become so regulated uh, and still more to come. So I think virtually every sector out there is going to see some regulations coming along their way. Um, you know, um, uh, I've been noticing which sectors have been getting a lot of funding uh, in 2020, and uh, of course, edtech uh, became a major um, funding uh, accumulator, I would say. And then, of course, there was gaming, and then there was hyperlocal and e-commerce to some extent. But fintech got very little funding during this time. 
So do you feel that particularly because uh, the, the focus of investors has been less on fintech during uh, the pandemic times, one, it is going to see any rise. Are we going to see at least some return back to normalcy on maybe 2019 last quarter or 2020 early first quarter levels um, as we enter into 2021? Yeah. So 2017 to 2019 was uh, kind of the golden period uh, for fintech. Um, and uh, uh, the first, uh, you know, first four months uh, post COVID was definitely challenging. And sure enough, I mean, Edutech um, was a, was a poster boy, and we saw all those brilliant numbers and exits and all of those things. Mm. Uh, so that definitely sparked a lot of entrepreneurs to suddenly start thinking about becoming Edutech entrepreneurs because the supply of capital maybe was much easier to get. So why try and um, get into fintech? But equally so, look, now it's all coming back. We've seen the razor pay story became a unicorn. Uh, we've seen the recent funding of uh, Turtle Mint, which is a socially distributed, you know, uh, insure tech platform. Hmm. Uh, on the lending side, payment side, I think we've seen uh, now lending will see, as I said, uh, it'll totally depend upon the financial strength of the business and what other, you know, cross sells can it create? Can it create a financial services ecosystem? Mm. Uh, and not just be a lending platform because a bare bone lending platform may not cut the eyes mm. uh, because there are several competing, you know, sort of entities in that sense. And mm. sure enough, you'll have a health of a book, but you also want a multiple. So if you have sold more things to the consumer than just, uh, you know, um, uh, on the asset side, then uh, that becomes uh, a much more holistic business mm. uh, and you're serving the full uh, consumer and you you know you you're not just waiting for them to take another loan which can be a couple of years down the line so the frequency of transactions is therefore much more than just taking a loan uh, the um, on the um, uh, on, on on the other side which is wealth i i certainly want i i certainly would reckon that there would be a pickup we yeah. saw a funding round for grow as well which took place during this time yeah. which was in the mutual fund space so i think some of the bigger ones have got identified and they've got invested in, and they have therefore come into a dominant position. And um, uh, now what we are seeing is a resurgence uh, where VCs are coming back and taking a look at what has emerged uh, as, as, as something that can be more sustainable and has a market leadership uh, status with a good team and a good um, you know, sustainable, scalable model. Uh, that is what will attract attention right now. Plain vanilla, me too stuff, unlikely to. Um, health is another area which has come up in a big way as well. And mm. uh, interestingly, what happens is, look, um, uh, fintech also is associated fintech. Right. So what we call it is, you know, for example, uh, we invested in a, uh, uh, in a in Gully Network, which is a tech-enabled modern network of, you know, medium-sized Kirana stores. And these um, grocery stores, they don't get access to formal credit. Kidding. Now, in the process of doing the business and creating this network, certainly it becomes a captive base uh, of SMEs on which a lending business can be created, hmm. right? So fintech sometimes is not pure fintech, but is associated fintech. Uh, so you start off with retail, but you build a layer of uh, lending on top of it. Hmm. You start off with a layer of lending, you can build a layer of insurance on it because you've got the financial details of the consumer you know what the penetration of different financial products uh, normally is in a, in, a, in, a, in, a, in a person's life. And whichever is missing, you can pitch it to them at the right time. Um, you know, because they are your customer now, you can speak to them. So um, I think the, the, the word, you know, also of FinTech and the world of FinTech has become um, a bigger and better, right? Um, so even B2B businesses are now creating a layer of on that. We saw Bharat Pay, for example, creating that layer, the, the, the actual ambition of, uh, you know, a MobiQuick, for example, which is in the payments business, is to create a whole layer of credit. So they're, they're developing a whole credit layer uh, to SMEs on the basis of the payments that they receive because they get to know the inflows and the outflows of the, of the, of the SME. Similarly here, you know, Bharat Pay, which is doing the acceptance for merchants, is tomorrow able to give working capital uh, much faster than a bank, right? Because, you know, the guy is busy as it had his shop. Uh, by the time he calls, you know, or he goes to a bank and says, I want a loan of this and puts an application and hears and submits documents, it's going to be like, you know, 15, 20 days. So instead of that, based on the inflows and outflows, the revenue-based financing model has also become extremely popular. So all of this requires data. So, but the data, I mean, it starts from payments, but then it can develop into lending. 
it can start from insurance or lending it can get into insurance so cross pollination is uh, is very much there uh, uh, so fintech can sometimes originate from mainline businesses uh, amazon for example i would say it's a it's a grand fintech company in india yes. you know it, it it is now helping you pay your bills everywhere they know your entire profile Correct. right they by giving you a small cash back what they managed to do is make you pay your telephone bill your insurance bill your broadband bill you know and you know three other four other bills you know that you were paying in any case uh now they've got access to your entire port profile mm -hmm. so they will be able to market several products bring in assortments of services onto you and uh, lo and behold i saw the other day you know i have a amazon business account um you know from some time ago so lo and behold i saw a 30000 rupee offer of uh, credit in my amazon business account based on my whatever transactions i may have done uh, uh, so this is um, an excellent example of how an, a fintech business can be created basis data in india we've had the problem of data mm. so whenever you had uh, whenever you get into a business with that data every business needs credit every business needs financial products from time to time you can definitely create a fintech company out of that no but tell me uh, i mean you you talked about um, you know fintech being part of a lot of other companies but can fintech companies also look at creating something uh, to the nature of i mean ptm of course did it they were a wallet and they also went on to do e commerce um, and we've also seen particularly uh, phone pay now getting so much into mutual funds and uh, you know other uh, sort of instruments that they want to dabble with so do you see that uh, fintech companies would be extending them extending their space whatever it is that they're doing and they would want to sort of jump into other places where their services may be and you know do it themselves rather than just be a service provider in one sense yeah so um, i think fintech um, companies um, uh, they tend to be large the players in the fintech space they are you know they are all large they can't be small uh by because you know they they rely on transactions and uh, transactions we do transactions all day and we need that for running our lives so um uh these are by nature they are large billion dollar uh you know uh, platforms which are uh, transacting with millions of consumers by the time they grow to a, you know to a respectable level they're already processing uh, billions of dollars of transactions so um, they are definitely going to create those behemoths so we have you know there are spaces available uh, very clearly where is the motilal oswal of uh, you know wealth management on today's public stock markets there where is the bajaj finance for india 3 uh, where is the um, you know india bulls um, you know for uh, india 2 and india 3 so these are the um, various examples of you know companies that that need to be created visa and master after two decades over here they managed to convert only 20% of india's uh, mm -hmm. transactions uh, you know into digital mm -hmm. and even they are like kind of now fighting with all the global you know payment players and qr code players and everybody's fighting with everybody and um, uh, you know so they're kind of dividing and carving out the pie amongst themselves but you know 70% of india still transacts in cash um so that business is left untapped so if you tap that business now that is just phenomenal uh you know there's 800 billion dollars of transactions which are happening in the micro payment space uh which which nobody has any idea who's paying whom and for how much and what frequency and all of them have a certain pattern frequency uh, uh a sense of regularity around them so if one is able to trap that data uh large parts of the economy can become formal hmm. and can get converted and can become really big businesses uh yeah. even bigger than banks uh banks in fact have a problem of credit today you know there's a, the uh, they have they have unutilized funds uh they want to give credit to but the problem is that they uh they are tired of reaching out and calling the same people that they want a loan uh the guy doesn't want a loan you know so and the people they uh, who 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 they can give a loan to they find them very risky because they they don't have the models to underwrite them right because they don't know what um, variables are required for underwriting them mm. so that is where fintechs come in and develop those automated underwriting models have low cost of operations uh, there's no physical you know frisking of documents and all of that to be done uh scan upload they have you know technology to uh do ocr on these 
um, uh, bank statements and make sense out of it because they've got the algorithmic models running at the back uh, to, to decipher a bank statement and to make sense out of it and see which are the variances and then underwrite a person and then be able to give an output in uh, 24 to 48 hours at the maximum uh, with a human uh, you know, looking at the net uh, submission by the machine. So the machine gets trained and better trained you know, based on the outcomes uh, and the number of data sets that it has. Uh, and that's the way into the future. So these are just large companies waiting to be had and none of the global companies actually have a formula of how to make it happen. Right. So if an Indian company does that, it can actually be applied in Africa, Vietnam, uh, Indonesia, anywhere, all of these emerging markets um, where um, similar challenges uh, are there. Right? Yeah. So, um, yeah, so, I mean, you, you know that in India, there was this big thing and there still is of this chit fund, you know, people have these committees and chits and uh, various scams also happened, um, you know, but they're not regulated. So all of these are informal lending channels, right? And uh, this is all that people had because they got refused by tier one banks. So um, tier one banks and, you know, they have a problem actually. They don't know who to give the loan to. Um, uh, the people they gave a loan to, they don't need a loan anymore. Uh, yeah. So, I mean, I mean, simplistically, I'm just exaggerating drive home the point, but basically they were, they're dealing with a very small set of people. They need to go beyond, but they don't have the models. Uh, their branches don't exist there. They don't have a technology model. So if you don't have physical distribution, you don't have tech, how are you going to tap that segment? You know, impossible. So that's where fintechs are going. Yeah, that's where fintechs are going and creating those models. Sure. We'll take some questions also, which have come yeah. along. Um, so there is uh, Shreya who's asking that, do you think the lockdown has accelerated digital cashless payments in non-metro cities? Do you think there's still a gap in terms of people trusting credit cards or are they already riding the digital wave? So um, uh, I think the, there has been a combination of a uh, few things. Uh, one is e-commerce has penetrated much higher during the lockdown period. We all are aware of that. So uh, uh, the large e-commerce portals, uh, they have experienced greater number of transactions hmm. uh, from the tier two cities. And uh, they have been obviously providing incentives for um, upfront payments rather than cash and delivery. Hmm. And uh, uh, people have been using therefore their debit cards, credit cards, or wallets. And uh, the easiest method now today that all of India knows, I can say with a great degree of confidence, is UPI. So everyone's uh, today using UPI. Mm -hmm. And UPI has been translated into a QR code, thanks to yeah. fintechs like Bharat Pay, et cetera, or even Paytm. So all you have to do is just open up any payment app of yours, which is providing the UPI. And if you've got a you know bank account connected to that app, uh, all it will do is ask you for that uh, um, a PIN code, right? So you enter the PIN and the money gets debited from your account through the UPI app. And uh, for knowing the merchant, you just scan the merchant code and you know the merchant code comes up. So UPI has actually become uh, the, the, the largest today payment mechanism mm. and uh, the most, I would say, newest uh, adopted payment mechanism. Uh, and especially so in the tier two cities. Reason for that is also because the penetration of credit cards um, is, is lower in the tier two cities. Mm. Um, tier one cities have multiple credit cards per person and uh, credit card companies have not really expanded their base in a big way because of uh, credit risks. So I think they're about 885 crore, there must say 85 crore uh, debit cards in India, uh, but I think only about 20 million uh, or two uh, you know, uh, crore uh, uh, yeah, but, uh, you know, a fraction of that is the you know, credit cards in the country. Hmm. And there is multiple ownership of credit cards. So um, really, you're talking about a very um, a small set of, you know, consumers who have access to credit cards. Yeah. <clears throat> so therefore, India has discovered UPI. Yes, correct. And which is, in fact, uh, directly because of the bank account linkage, it's so much easier to use. and So much easier. So much easier. Yes. And it is reliable. It's instant. It's like cash. Hmm. Right, so if you've got a 4G network, if you've got a smartphone, this is the best way. If you don't have a smartphone, don't have a 4G network, then you have a problem. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. So there's Neha who's asking that, do you think there's gonna be consumer wars um, that are likely to come up with uh, so many payment apps 
out there and wallets in the market i mean you know i think she's referring to whatsapp now being game as well yeah yeah oh definitely there is a there is a war on which is going to happen out there government has capped uh, you know upi payment limits to 30% per provider as well uh, i think phone pay was uh, the dominant player over there hmm. so um, there is definitely going to be war out there uh, consumers are going to be spoiled for choice there is going to be cashback so get ready to enjoy uh, uh, more uh, yeah get more for your money <clears throat> but um, certainly the entry of whatsapp uh, will change uh, quite a few things because it will it is quite convenient uh, i think um, you know I, there is no doubt that the highest penetrated app in the country uh, is is, uh, is 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 whatsapp <clears throat> so therefore um, uh, everybody uses it across socio economic classes uh it is used you know so uh, we find um, uh, everybody using this particular so one once you have the payment app next to it then obviously since it is the most convenient enjoys your trust you'll rather not link your bank account to multiple payment apps uh you'll rather link it to one or two maximum and uh, depending on you know the acceptance and whatsapp should be accepted nearly everywhere so yeah it's already so commonly used so i mean it's just, yeah yeah, just, yeah. <clears throat> yeah but um, having said that look the e-commerce providers who are forced to offer these uh, apps earlier so phone pay as we know is flipkart and then there is um, amazon with amazon pay uh, you know and there was you know free charge at that one time with associated with snap deal etc so the um, some of these wallets they might uh, you know they might prevent the entry of uh, whatsapp let's see what happens yeah let's see sure. yeah yeah fine. let's see what happens over there so there's yet another question from dev who's saying that how can um, how can how can uh, lending uh, lending startups ensure less npas um, in the coming times i think that's where it's leading i understand yeah. so um, i think look a brilliant question the uh, it's very easy to lend there is infinite demand for loans but uh, <clears throat> the difficult part is to get the money back as I say so uh, underwriting uh is 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 the science over here um hmm. uh, and being uh, you know eliminating manual decision making in underwriting that i think is uh what i have learned from some of our investments hmm. uh one has to be ruthless about framing those rules and then not letting uh you know manual overrides for the sake of business growth hmm. uh compromise some of those underwriting decisions so when you know that a profile is going to be risky then you know you can't sort of overturn it manually by taking a business call uh somewhere or, or the other it is going to hurt you and uh, therefore one has to be a little bit cautious uh the approval rate for most you know lending companies is is is, is single digits right so out of every 100 applications maybe 3 4 5% you know uh if you're very good maybe 10% you know th that's very very good right uh if you have a very well oiled and quality uh, lead generation system or mechanism <clears throat> so um yeah so i think the uh, the whole discipline of underwriting that has to be maintained that's the main thing collections etc in india tend to be weak of course there are a number of protocols sending smss reminders all of that but when a person has decided to default then uh, you know that's the, that's really based on um how good your underwriting was able to uh anticipate that and prevent that from happening hmm. sure and finally you know i would love to know um i mean if if not fintech as an area of investment at orios what else what other sectors would you be interested in as a fund to invest so we think um uh, <clears throat> gaming is definitely an area uh, which has seen an uptick um india was i think reported uh, very recently as having the highest number of gaming downloads <laughs> in the um, gaming in, in this entire covid period so um, i think we're going uh, from strength to strength well, uh, since we are not going to be very happy to hear that <laughs> <laughs> uh well since we can't go to multiplexes and you know school is only half day what do you do and uh, so i think everybody is enjoying that um second bit is uh, uh agri so agri is a very big area it's a untapped area the recent farm bills by the government are a progressive move i certainly feel that way of course there's a lot of political heat around it yeah. but uh, you know farmers have never been getting their dues uh in our country there has been lack of investment in cold storage and and, and the entire supply chain 
And the reason for that has been that the markets have been uh, constrained to be operating uh, not at the farm level, but at the mandi level. So farmers are supposed to bring their produce at the mandi level at the APMCs, and that's where they're supposed to sell it from. There is a concerted group of middlemen uh, who, of course, facilitate the transactions, but operate by their very informal rules. And they are all, you know, sort of the middlemen who supposedly add value, but I don't think they add uh, any value other than facilitating a transaction uh, which suffers from an asymmetry of uh, information on supply and pricing and demand, right? The moment you solve for that asymmetry, which you can do with technology, uh, consumers can place their orders, corporates can place their orders. Uh, for the next season, a farmer knows what to, what to plant, how much business can they do. There is a contract over there, no different from any other contract that you would sign electronically today, you know, including the ones that you sign when you download an app from the Play Store. Uh, so uh, all of this can be made very seamless, yeah. right? Yeah. Uh, and escrow accounts can be created, you know, corporates would be very happy to uh, take long-term positions, long-term contracts, put quality um, uh, controls, and uh, make the requisite amounts of, you know, um, um, investments in the infrastructure. Mm -hmm. When they know that a certain amount of supply is captive and is coming in and they've got to store it, and then they can make money on it by releasing it into the market uh, based on the demand. Uh, so um, there is there is there is the agri sector which which has to be get completely reformed, uh, you know. Otherwise, uh, it'll just stay very much behind, and the agri distress uh, will continue, um, you know. And we'll keep uh, paying taxes on one side, and we'll keep seeing those taxes being used as uh, loan waivers on the other side. Uh, we have to make a sustainable financial agricultural model today. The only sustainable financial model in agriculture is uh, that of the middleman. It's right. not of the farmer, yeah. But do you think it's going to drag agriculture down before it sort of puts it up? Because it is always- Maybe grass food guy at the end of the day. <laughs> Look, there is always, um, uh, <clears throat> there is always a pause uh, before you shift gears, right? Whether you're driving a car or whatever. So um, that is bound to happen, that is bound to happen. But we know that what we've done over the last 50, 60 years hasn't really worked. Yeah. Where are we today? We, are, we aren't getting the freshest of vegetables. Farmers are in distress. There are suicides, all of that. So, uh, you know, loan waivers are going out um, hand over fist. And that's all public tax money, which could have been utilized to improve the very lot of those farmers. But instead of writing off loans, we should be creating uh, systems by which they can access the best prices, the best agricultural inputs, make them more successful, and for us as consumers to you know, experience better prices, because I don't know whether we all know, but 30% of uh, food is wasted along the chain because yeah. uh, of uh, poor logistics and uh, poor infrastructure in the country. Yeah. Uh, so all of this can be improved, uh, right? And the, it's, it's, you know, it's the middleman who's making the money. Yeah. So um, non-value adding uh, you know, intermediaries um, have to be removed if a sector has to be transform from unorganized to organize it has we have seen that happening in so many different areas uh, through startups you know various uh, startups have come in on and have, have uh, done that very successfully e-commerce is, is a is a perfect example yeah. um, and given opportunities i mean today so many sellers who are operating on e-commerce websites they're good businesses earlier they had a very few small client base today they are present on an amazon or a flip card they're able to sell to the whole country they're even able to sell to uh, overseas and they don't have to set up warehouses and logistics and you know do all of that marketing etc. They get to be placed on a on a search based uh, mall, right? So uh, and that is what consumers are excited by because you know that's what they come over there every day. They find so many useful things just by using search keywords based on what they wish to buy, right? So they don't need to spend time uh, traveling through a mall to find what they need to buy. Yeah. Uh, they can find everything, and that's why it's taken off. So. Uh, it's the same thing uh, uh, which can happen in the agri industry. We know that the inputs are counterfeited. We know that farmers don't have the access to the best farm equipment. Uh, productivity can be increased. Uh, advisories um, can be given out to them, tips on how to get the best output, what to plant. In fact, we invested in a, um, a, a farmers, a LinkedIn for farmers called Krishify. So there is 10 lakh farmers on the platform today. Um, the company just um, uh, finished a pre-series A round with a leading investor and uh, farmers are, you know, giving each other information, uploading videos, and tomorrow they will be exchanging equipment 
they can rent equipment rent tractors rent all of this they can get information on the best authentic seeds and fertilizers and everything else um and they don't have to go to the one single retail shop outside their gaon which is a very which is a very restricted way of functioning so all of these were you know artificial constraints which were put on the farming economy and uh, they have to be released the investments have to come in uh, but large companies will not invest uh, you know if you're throttling all uh, free market forces um, so i think some of this um, we will see so we are certainly you know want to jump into that uh, and and take a bit of bet on that education still remains on our radar education is a big area health is a big area um so uh, we made some investments in the health space farm easy which is recently you know um, um, wrapped some good rounds going to be a unicorn uh just got, went into a merger with medlife um uh, consolidation has taken place now there's 70% of the pharmacy club similarly beto which is um, into the um, diabetic um, you know uh, digital health space um we're looking at women's health we're looking at um, children's health um uh, we're looking at you know newer areas geriatric as well so uh, uh these are all new areas uh, i think which are exciting investment spaces a lot of work to be done absolutely and we're looking forward to it uh, totally <laughs> which are the new unicorns that are going to emerge from your kitty uh, it's always so good and heartening to see how these startups and the young businesses they grow and become so large so fast and you know why we keep calling them startups but by no means are they startups they they really large businesses <laughs> So sure. thank you so much Anoop for joining us today and talking to us and uh, you know there I mean pandemic or no pandemic we uh, business is on you know we're not lights are not stopping and we're doing new things um I would request all our audience to continue asking more questions please join our pages our links are right here uh, on the screen and you know any questions that you have from the investor community or you have some questions around startups we're always happy to answer them from you in fact you know we'll try to push the investors to answer them for you and uh, help you in any way we can thank you once again anup it's always wonderful to talk to you and next time hopefully off the screen and in person as we yes. meet <laughs> thank you radu pleasure always to uh, connect with you and thank you for inviting me over and I hope this was useful for your audience uh, absolutely I appreciate oh, no i think there's some great ideas you brought forward and uh, i'm sure we'll see only the results of it in 2021 going ahead thank you thank you very much